There's a lot we can unpack today. We can, I feel like going chronologically is going to be the best option. But <clears throat> jumping around is fine too as things come up. So like, for example, if we were gonna talk about Neville and you know, his storyline may be in more than one spot or something, but we have Ariana Dumbledore looking over us today. Mm -hmm. Creepy. Mm -hmm. Very. Very creepy. <laughs> um, so the book opens with Harry making a decision. He's on the stairwell inside of Shell Cottage, and he's got Ron and Hermione with him. And on the stairwell to this side is where the goblin is hanging out, getting better. And over here is where Ollivander is getting better. And the last time we met, I mentioned that this was kind of an overlap moment because the end of the first part and the beginning of the second part are kind of happening simultaneously. And so I was asking you guys to look for that as you watch this one. But he chose to talk to the goblin first. And so the goblin represents his choice of talking to the goblin first represented a turning point in his thinking of where he was going with his mission. And choosing not to talk to Ollivander first was another thing, because at this moment, really, Dumbledore's wand was still in Dumbledore's tomb. It hadn't been officially like pulled out yet. All those, both of those things are kind of happening simultaneously at the moment when Harry's choosing who to talk to first, the goblin or the wand maker. So what did you guys notice about those two conversations? And what does it show us about Harry's like story arc and where the, you know, the final chapter is going here? Not everyone at once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In his conversation with Gripbook, that he is a lot more determined um, to get answers and to get something accomplished, I think, than he is with Ollivander, where he's more careful um, due to Ollivander's, you know, condition and, uh, you know, how long he's been a prisoner and everything. Mm -hmm. I, th I think he kind of knew the answers he would get out of the one mm -hmm. but he you know it, it, the conversation was for him just a reassurance of what he had probably put together but the goblin was the one that held the secret i have a question yeah why did the goblin want the sword what was the goblin yeah. made he believes it's belongs it should belong to the goblins yeah so ownership not not anything about the sword itself it didn't really matter that it was like Gryffindor sword it mattered that it was like the goblin sword yeah the goblins initially made the sword and it was Gryffindor's sword but um in the book Bill who is a Weasley but he works for the bank so he has insight into the goblins personalities and and their um just who they are and he explained to Harry after that moment it, it's not like they just get up and leave they, they spend about a month there preparing in the book but um but Bill warns Harry and says goblins don't understand ownership the way that wizards do they believe that if they've made the object they're loaning it to the wizard to use or to where or to have and then that so for example there was a tiara and flora got to wear it for her wedding the goblin would have assumed that after so and so loaned it to fleur then it would then go back to the goblin like it should be a, a back and forth between goblin wizard goblin wizard every time and not goblin to wizard to wizard to wizard and so they just don't believe in inheritance the way that we do, since they're the ones who made it. Um, 
what's the status of the goblin in comparison to the wizards? They're like lower, as we saw in the statue ministry, they're seen as lower class. They just work at the bank, and that's pretty much all wizards view them as. Just serving. Just like house elves. Is that the only place you'll find them? Is that the bank? Is that their only Green job? Gods is the that we know of. Yeah. That's the only yeah, place you see them on the rock as well. Yeah. But I think it's I think it's fair to note that <clears throat> while they are seen as lower class, Bill warns has to warn Harry not to not to be making deals with them because he they are they're clever, they're tricky, they're you know, they're uh, not to be messed around with. You know, they're they're formidable, I guess. It's not advisable to mess with anyone who handles your money, I feel like. <laughs> yeah, <I'm sorry. laughs> Very true. Yeah, for sure. Keep that friendly relationship. I mean, as you can see by all the goblin wars taught in history of magic, there's definitely been conflicts before. And the goblin, though, he is inclined to work with Harry because he's he says, well, even among goblins, you're famous, Harry Potter. And he noticed out the window that Harry dug the grave for Dobby. He noticed that Harry saved him and, and made sure that it wasn't just humans that got out of the dungeon and out of the Malfoy Manor, but it was, you know, they were trying to get Dobby out. And then also here he was a goblin. And so Grip Hook is willing to partner with Harry, even if he does think Harry's going to double cross him, which Harry's intention is to double cross him. Um, and yet the goblin's still willing to work with him. And I think that that theme is what <clears throat> comes through throughout the rest of this. And this is where Harry's progressing in maturity and really becoming his own person owning up to what Dumbledore has been trying to instill in him with that theme of the greater good. Because Harry, in the last book and movie, Harry kind of panicked that when he found out that Dumbledore had been working with Grindelwald, which Harry had heard that Grindelwald was like the worst dark wizard or whatever. And he just for a while was panicked that Dumbledore was like, all bad because he was leaning towards that for one summer of his youth. And, um, and yet we watch Harry progress throughout this book, this movie, and recognizing that he does have to make some sacrifices, including his own life for the greater good in, in that regard. And whether that's all right, it, it is the decision that Harry goes with. Also, I think it pointed out a fault that we all tend to have when we have a mentor or someone that we look up to we tend to assume that they are perfect right and the realization that they're human and make mistakes and don't always take the right road or choice or decision yeah and it's almost like if that happens then it's like you have to abandon that person as a leader just because of the one mistake or whatever. And that's, that's tough because no one's going to be perfect. And I mean, even watching Harry and we've talked about Harry as like a Christ figure. And obviously that shows up here where he's going to die for his friends and not even just his friends, but everyone. Um, and he ends up using the imperious curse mm -hmm. at the bank to get what he needs to. Like that's that's not the attribute of a hero. I pointed that out when we were watching that. Just like old Harry would have never done that, yeah, right? It shows, it shows, it shows the first year Harry would have never done that. He's more focused on beating Voldemort and winning the war at any cost instead of upholding the law because the law is now controlled by people on Voldemort's side. There's no point following the ministry if the ministry is dark. Right. No, that's a really good point. That's a really good I mean, point. Harry's already a criminal. It's not like using the Imperius curse is going to make him more of a criminal. It's undesirable. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's that's that is a main point, and not only that. I mean, that 
that theme is going to come up again when we talk about the elder wand and the final battle here in a little bit too. Um, I think that, um, that it's so interesting because Harry's wrestling with so many doubts about, is he even capable of finding all of these horcruxes? Is, um, is his friendship with his friends going to stay intact? I mean, they've been having trouble out on the road or whatever. Is he going to be able to keep it a secret much longer what he's doing without Voldemort figuring it out? I mean, there's so many doubts, but he also has all these doubts towards Dumbledore, which we, like you just said, if that was your mentor and, and it, he causes you to then stumble in your own faith in him because he's not perfect. Um, that goes back to, you know, that man who brings his son to Jesus to be healed and says, I believe, but help my unbelief. Harry's continuing forward in the journey, regardless of the fact that he has doubts right now. And that's a testament to the commitment he has to wizard kind and just you know, humanity that he's, he's willing to keep moving forward on that. I think that's, that's interesting. So anything else before we move into Hogsmeade? Anything in that early part? Anything about Gringotts, the dragon? Well, they freed the dragon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It was so like I hate I hate that scene like where they showed the dragon like that, but so I, sad for him. Yeah, you know? because like dragons are such like proud creatures. Like if we look in the fourth book and like look at the dragons, they're they're not meant to be chained up like that. And like if you look at the dragon, it's all like like bloodied and like injured. And I don't know. It was nice that they broke the dragon out. Yeah. <laughs> Was nice for them I, too. Yeah, I mean, also, <laughs> out for that. I think it was a good like friendship, like team bonding moment, you know, to break a dragon out together, you know, pretty, 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 pretty good bonding. Yeah, pretty noteworthy, yeah. I would say. You want to get out? <laughs> I got no other way. <laughs> I think it's interesting. The thing that part of that scene that always stands out to me is grip grip hooks. Um, yeah. uh, oh, camera. I'm sorry. Uh, is is grip hook is the goblin, right? Mm -hmm. That's the same. Is his proclivity to go too far and the greed and how it basically ends him. Yeah, maybe you know, he dies. He, if like Harry would have made sure that he stayed. Got on the dragon too. Right? Yeah. Right. Like that, that's in his in his and I thought that was that that ties into something else that we'll talk about later, but it ties into a theme of um, Careful what you wish for, that, that it'll it, it may it, you may get it. So he got the sword, but then he died. Yeah, so yeah. Like, and then the sword disappeared again, yeah, ready yeah. to be um, available for Neville when he needed it. You know, yeah. I mean, something that the movie did that the books actually uh, the movie added to the uh, from to the books uh, was the death of the the goblin that he put under the Imperius curse and the, the dragon like he was under the he was like shaking the his empty hand and the goblin uh, the dragon just tortures him and i like how that kind of signifies this is you know obviously we've known at this point that this this is not a children's story anymore this is full-blown we are going to war you know this is a battle is coming yeah, it's yeah. real no, stuff no holding back yeah yeah, yeah. It's not, I, it's not silly anymore. I yeah. think I think that was an important part of the movie per se. That life is not Cinderella. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that you know, I can remember when the movies first came out, a lot of the critics were saying, Oh, this is too dark for you to take your kids to. Mm -hmm. You know, this is like real life. Yeah. Wake up, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it pr provides not only the team building that you mentioned earlier, but them breaking out of there gives them a moment when they get off the dragon and they're, you know, setting up camp for a minute to kind of gather themselves and they get to have that moment of levity for a second. And I don't know if it comes through as well of humor in the movie because it's more Harry panics and saying, we just got to get to Hogwarts. But in the book, Ron says he loses all his good lines. He loses all his really good. He says, well, I think pretty soon they're going to know that we're all working together. We just stole a dragon and broke out of Green Gods. And they're just like <laughs> laughing and they can't stop laughing. And they just, they haven't had a moment to laugh in a right. long time. Yeah. 
But it's like, we just did something so ridiculous and we're okay. We're burned a little, but we're okay. And okay, we're going to laugh a minute. We're going to drink some pumpkin juice. And now we're going to get to hogs meat and we're going to figure this thing out. Like it was, you know, they have a moment to catch their breath and laugh and just, and, and let loose for a second. That's sometimes the only way you get through a yep. right situation. <laughs> yeah. So then we make it to Hogsmeade and we find out that it's not been Professor Dumbledore, but it's been his brother, also Dumbledore, Aberforth, that's been looking at Harry in that mirror. And so um, how has that mirror helped them? And do we know kind of the origin of this mirror? Where is this mirror from? The mirror is serious because Harry and Sirius had their two-way mirrors. So Harry had one mirror, Sirius had the other mirror. And it was like a way for them to communicate. And then Mundungus Fletcher, who was in the order, sold the mirror to Aberforth. But Harry had a little chip of it. So he was able to see like the other Dumbledore through the mirror. And then Aberforth sent Dobby and provided like aid. Did he know it was Aberforth or did no? no he didn't was, know, he didn't know it might have been Dumbledore. That's what I thought. Um, but um, I'm just thinking of Seinfeld or just stanza, kind of. I snip. I guess you Um, but I think that um, just as far as logistics go. I love the change they did to the movie where it was just a sliver off that same mirror. When in reality it was two separate mirrors, but I, it presented that in such an artful way that right, that like was a broken the mirror still working. Yeah, and so here in this section we learn a little bit more about our creep here, Ariana. We have a portrait of Ariana hanging back here in her full creepiness. Yeah. Um, and we find out a little bit more about Dumbledore's backstory. We don't get a lot here. Um, so does that feel complete to you all? Or does it feel confusing a little bit as far as, you know, Dumbledore and his brother and I his like, sister? I like Harry's line. And I don't know if he said it in the books. I can't quite remember. But in the movie, he says to Aberforth, uh, some along the lines of, I don't care who he used to be. I trusted the man that I knew. And it was, this is the person that he was as I knew him, and I trust him, and I'm going through with what he wanted me to do. The, I feel like if I was just watching the movie, I would definitely have a lot of questions about Dumbledore's backstory because mm -hmm. Aberforth isn't exactly forthcoming with yeah. information. And well, he's also kind of curmudgeon y, mm -hmm. which is so opposite of what Harry is at this point because he's still so youthful. I mean, 17, and he's got this vision. Aberforth feels so jaded and just like, I think. Him and his brother don't get along, right? Yeah. They, it's like a, there was a whole fight that happened. But that's how Ariana died. So, I do it's think it's it, it's funny how the movie kind of alludes to that ever since, um, you know, that fight where Ariana got um, killed, that Aberforth and Dumbledore never spoke again or didn't talk much at all. But we do know that uh, like even Professor Trelawney, her interview at the school where she first told the prophecy um, and that Snape was listening in, that was at the hog's head when Aberforth was there and Dumbledore was there. So they had to have some type of connection. Something had to be on. Aberforth was not completely clueless to what was going on with his brother. And not only that, but there was another time when um, when Harry and Dumbledore flew away to go get that Horcrux locket. Mm -hmm. And Dumbledore said to um, Madame Rose Murda, who works at the Three Broomsticks, sorry, I'm going to go have a drink at the Hogshead tonight. And he told Harry, sometimes I go to the Hogshead and sometimes I go to the Three Broomsticks and sometimes I just disappear and then they never know where I am. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, he was going there too. So it wasn't a full blown, you know, complete missed opportunity for a relationship, but it definitely was strained after, after that incident, that death. But the other thing is, I mean, Aberforth was part of the order. He was trying to do what was right, but he had also kind of given up. He's like, the Order of the Phoenix is done. Voldemort's won, you know. 
but um, but back to the Ariana thing and this progression of Harry trusting Dumbledore. Um, the thing that we know from the books with Hermione doing her research on Horcruxes is that the only way to mend your soul after you have, and, and she said it in the previous movie, but um, the only way to mend your soul from having been split with a Horcrux would be pure remorse. So if you were 100% remorseful and sought forgiveness, right, then you, you could regain your soul. And that was the only thing. Um, <clears throat> I want to skip ahead to Albus and Harry talking in King's Cross. So in the vision, when Harry's in his little in-between state, um, there was an incident in 2007 when the writer of this book got to ask one question to J.K. Rowling. And she did this. Given the opportunity to ask only one question, mine addressed this issue of Dumbledore and remorse. I wanted to know if this display of remorse after his death, so him telling Harry, this is what I regret is my sister dying, um, was showing the fact that he couldn't rest in peace during eternity. And she assured me and anyone else who was troubled by this, that Dumbledore's emotional display of grief was not meant to indicate the quality of Dumbledore's experience in the afterlife. Rather, it was important for Harry to see his mentor's admission of human frailty attended with remorse. Harry had put Dumbledore on a pedestal in order to become a man, though. Harry had to understand Dumbledore as someone who had made mistakes, but who, unlike Voldemort, was man enough to feel and express remorse. So this element of for the greater good was something that Dumbledore and Grindelwald had thought would be a way for them to seek ultimate power, that wizards could be the most powerful for the greater good. But at the death of his sister, he repented of that way of thinking, but held on to that frame of mind in recognizing that Harry would have to die for the greater good. And, and we find out you know, with Snape accusing Dumbledore, well, oh, you just raised him up like a pig for the slaughter. And Dumbledore is thinking, well, I mean, for the greater good. Like it was a theme that wove through his life since he was 17. And it's carried on through even in his death, right? Yeah, that's the one time I like Snape. That one line. Yeah. One time Snape is tolerable. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I do want to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do want to talk about him more when we get to that, but that's the ultimate moment for, for Voldemort. Harry says to him, how about a little remorse riddle? He gives him a moment and yeah, it's tongue in cheek a little bit, but it's a moment where Harry's recognizing you could keep your soul if you could show remorse and yet he, he can't. So then the portrait opens up and here comes Neville. And I feel like that, hi. I feel like that is the most fun, the most fun in the book or not in the book, in the movie is them coming through that portrait into the room of requirement. I remember being in the theater the night that it came out and like everybody's cheering the music and like the kids in there are cheering and I don't even care that this is not how it happened in the book. I don't care at all because it was like so victorious. Like it was a great scene, right? So what does this mean for us here? What, what do we notice during this time? Neville's been leading this opposition. Harry, Hermione, and Ron have been finding horcruxes less successfully than they would like. And they all come together here. So what's kind of happening in this, in this moment? I like that they allude again to um, how... Neville could have just as easily been the child of prophecy um, if Voldemort had chosen to track him down instead of Harry. Um, Neville was a natural born leader, even if he didn't know it, even if it took a while to get there, he was a leader. You know, uh, uh, right as Harry was doing his job and he was, you know, leading Ron and Hermione through the, the wilderness, 
Neville was there. He was still fighting. He he was leading the opposition. He was not even just part of it. He was at the forefront of it. So so go, going in on that, this is kind of what I was talking about earlier. Is careful what you wish for. You just want to get it type of idea. That that like. like Colin and I were talking about the movie. I was like, so what they're saying is that Voldemort made the prophecy true about Harry. And and like that that's such a true like we often create can create the things we're scared of most to actualize them in our lives. So you know. Yeah, go ahead. Go, going back to I, I talked about Sybil Chani, uh her interview to join to join the school as a professor and then that's the first time that she ever gave an actual prophecy other time she was basically a fraud um and snape was listening in and that was before snape had become dumbledore's man he did not hear the whole prophecy if i remember it correctly he only he did not hear the part where uh it said that dumbledore would mark the the chosen one as his equal he, he would mark that child as his equal and so when Snape went back to report half the prophecy, he was leading, you know, unwittingly leading Voldemort into, into the whole thing. It was like the perfect setup, I guess, for it. So what else here about Neville contrasting with Harry? Well, Neville, through most of the book, is the one everybody laughs at, the one the one who always gets the bottom of the stick, you know. It, no matter what that kid does, it doesn't work out right. He's and, like, like the two foot and two left foot. Right, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, but you you also have to remember that inside of Neville, Neville carried that that constant thought of what his parents died for. Yeah. Their, their strength, you know, <laughs> saying no matter what they went through, they did not get, that's that's a martyr syndrome. Yeah. Okay, and he, he carried that with him. And I think he showed that even though he might fear what is to come, that wasn't going to detract him from doing what he felt was right. And that gave him strength. Yeah. I think I think a lot um, as well that people don't really, uh, uh, it's it's such a small, minute detail. And it goes for Ron as well. Ron is the exact same way. Is we we know that the wand chooses the wizard, right? Ron and Neville both had hand-me-down wands for a lot of their Hogwarts career. And that is where a lot of their problems come from. When Ron finally gets his own new wand and when Neville, I think Neville in the fifth, the fifth book, he gets in, uh, a new one because his grandma's proud of him for. Uh, ten, or at the end of the fifth. End of yeah. the fifth. End of the fifth. Yeah, because she's so proud of him, and so he gets that new one, and then we really start to see that Neville is talented, but he's at he's been at a disadvantage the whole time. Yeah, because he's been using his father's wand. Yes. Whereas Ron is using Bill's wand or Charlie's wand or some type of hand me down. They both were at such a disadvantage, but they were both so extremely talented, but they just didn't. They always stop, it, right? you know, compared to the chosen one, compared to Harry Potter, you know. Like, I feel like with Neville's wand, I think it's because his grand wanted him to emulate his father. His father was like, his father was so brave, he was like a Gryffindor. And I think Neville also wanted to follow in those footsteps. But until he got his own wand, he didn't realize his like full potential as a wizard. Because um, also I feel like that ties in with how everyone else saw him. Because for the first five years, he was he couldn't do magic as well as any, everyone else because he had that like limitation on him. But then in the seventh book, we see that he's leading this whole group of students and that he's fighting back. And I think that shows a switch in Neville. Yeah. I think it is an excellent point, though, that like you said, it, it wasn't until after the battle at the Ministry of Magic that he got his new one. And Neville held his own in that fight, even without, you know, a wand that was his, his own. He, he still worked. It was pure work ethic, you know, and the Dumbledore's army and things like that. He worked so hard to be able to be there, to stand next to his friends and say, I am worthy of standing next to these people, you know. And, and it's interesting seeing Neville in this last movie. Like that he is like he's the one that comes out of the painting. 
You know, he's the one that all that, and then like how he interacts with Luna. He's like, we may all die tonight. I need to let Luna know how I feel. <laughs> there was a lot of those moments. Right? Yeah, like you know, like that just over there, like that's that's from a point of a confidence in yourself. You know, like that's really turned a corner. So like yeah. in the yeah. moment when he talks about how he directly defied professors, like the Caros. They wanted him, they wanted them to like practice the crucio on the first yeah. years, and he, 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 pre- he took a uh, physical punishment over harming first years. Yeah, because he was really banged up. Yeah, he, that's that's from the professors. Yeah. It shows that he like finally found since first year he's had that backbone, but he's shown it now. Yeah, yeah he's really living now. And he yeah. and that's expressed the whole I mean sort of Gryffindor goes oh, to yeah. yeah. He's a true yeah. Gryffindor. Yeah. 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 So, and I mean, to go that. back to that prophecy, it took Neville and Harry. I mean, it took a lot of people for the whole thing mm-hmm. to be finalized. But I mean, Neville got his chance to destroy a Horcrux, too. Mm-hmm. I think I think uh, even, you know, like like you said, Neville's kind of uh, laughed at throughout the entire movies. But I feel like he almost embodies Gryffindor's traits better than Harry does in a way, because, you know, like Harry is very stuck between he has these Slytherin qualities and he has his Gryffindor qualities. He's back and forth and that's kind of his arc. And that was even in the first movie, you would do really well in Slytherin and you know things like that. Yeah. But Neville, he is full blown what Gryffindor stands for. Mm-hmm. Even even you know he might have a little huffle puff in the in the loyalty how loyal he is. But you know it's okay. <laughs> Loyal. Yeah, exactly. He he really is such a great, you know, this is what a Gryffindor should be. There's a beautiful, oh, go ahead. Well, and I was going to say, when he, at the end, when Harry's dead, yes. and he stands up to Voldemort and everybody, mm-hmm. and, like, he's, he's finally standing in the point of, like, full confidence of what's going on, he's like, it doesn't matter. Like, if, if we all quit now just because Harry's dead, it doesn't like it all meant nothing yeah and and so like that 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 was a great theme yeah it's a great it's a great it's a great scene in the movie it's just, yeah. yeah and ron's done the same in a sense when they were at the beginning of the seventh movie in that cornfield and harry was going to just take off and then ron says to him you think this is just about you mate Do you right. think everyone here is just dying for you no, no there, it's much bigger than that and he needs harry needs people like neville and ron to continue to remind him of that vision that you know Dumbledore had set in place for them to realize, again, this for the greater good. We just have to keep moving forward if we're going to ultimately eliminate this guy. But um, something that doesn't come across as well, and I understand why they don't do it because the movie does need to just keep moving forward with action. I get that. Um, I don't. Chloe always pauses to complain about this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, so in the room of requirements, the kids are kind of at a standstill oh, here. Because I don't even know what you thought I was going to complain about. <laughs> we'll talk about it. We'll just get to it. We'll talk about it. <laughs> so, um, so Neville and Seamus and Jenny. And all Luna before she was kidnapped, all these kids who had been part of the Defense Against the Dark Arts Club, the, you know, Dumbledore's Army back in book five, they're all wreaking havoc on Snape and his regime at Hogwarts. And they refer to it as the regime. Like, they are graffitiing the walls. They are, like, pulling pranks. They are trying to... um, to stand up to the oppressive regime here, right? And the teachers support them. The teachers like yeah, George and Madonna. Yeah, they turn them in for all yeah. of their yeah. um, wrongdoings. And, to let them do so. Yeah. And then sometimes they even find out that they get like, and then we find this out earlier on uh, in the in the book, but like they're even getting punishment with Hagrid, which then starts to give you the element of knowing Snape's in on this too. He's only giving them punishment with Hagrid. Right. Like, okay, mm-hmm. they're just gonna go have a laugh in the forest. But um, but what's happening is in this moment of confusion in the room of requirement, Harry shows up trying to hold on to these secrets, just like his pal Dumbledore used to keep secrets. I can't tell anyone else what we're looking for. 
but I've got to find this thing and I don't know what I'm looking for. We get that sense in the book, in the movie, and that's fine. But the sense we don't really get is that political nature is that Harry knows that the only way to move forward ultimately is not just to knock out the oppressive regime, but it's to knock out the power behind it. He knows they have to get rid of Voldemort and Harry knows that he's the only one that can get rid of Voldemort. And even at this moment, he doesn't know the whole Horcrux thing about himself yet, but he senses this. And this comes in to, um, comes into play in a way that reminds me of how the disciples expectation, even after Jesus is resurrected from the dead and they're like, okay, now's the time you're going to, you know, you're going to sack, sack Rome now, Jesus. And he's like, you just don't get it. Like we're not, that's not, that's not what's happening now. It is not for you to know the time or the date that the father is set by his own authority, but you will receive the power of the Holy spirit. So like, it's not time for Neville to see this full picture yet. Neville gets his moment. He sees the full picture once Harry's finally dead. But like in this moment, he's like, all right, we're going to, we're going to go stick the caros now. No, Neville, we're not fighting. I need to find something so I can kill Voldemort. Like wake up, buddy. So I, I thought that was interesting. I like, I like how, um, you know, we talk about Harry's character growth through the books, but I like how we didn't just get to the last book or get to the last movie and Harry is the perfect hero and he's mm-hmm. doing everything right. And he's, you know, back and forth or, you know, he is still messing up. Like you said, he's still like, I've got to keep these secrets, like just like Dumbledore did. And it, it, I like how it alludes, like, like you said, back to, um, this isn't just about you. This is, you know, he, he can't do this alone. He's right. been, he's been leaning on uh, Ron and Hermione this whole time. And sure, they're his closest friends, but he's not alone in this. And then it even goes to a wider thing of Ron and Hermione can't do this. Look at all the, the support they have from the, the kids in the room of requirement. They're all ready to fight. They're all ready to pitch in in any way they can, but he still can't let go and, and trust them and bring them into the inner circle. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> so... So to transition and just another funny thing that is missing, um, Cho says, I can take you to go see the crown of Rowena Ravenclaw. There's a model in the, in the tower of Ravenclaw. We can go look for it. And then Jenny's like, uh, Luna can take him. (laughs) I I like that little love triangle. (laughs) So they end up, you know, but Luna got her moment. It it was cute. It was cute. But it was Cho saying, "Um, I'll take you. (laughs) And one of the best moments in the book after that is is Harry protecting McGonagall and 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 stunning um, was it the sister? Or no, it was the brother. It was the brother. That was definitely one of the scenes they should have included in the movies. I understand why they didn't build a set for Rowena, or Ravenclaw Tower just for that one scene. I get it. And I still think it's a beautiful moment, even though it's not Harry standing up for McGonagall, but McGonagall standing up for Harry showed just how much might is behind Harry. Mm-hmm. He's not in this alone. And he got to see in that moment those people back him up. The, you know, the Order of the Phoenix shows up. McGonagall's there to, like, fight for him. And then half or two thirds, at least, maybe three fourths of those students even, you know, were ready to be on his side. Um, one thing, and I don't know if you guys noticed this in the um, in that scene where McGonagall and Snape are fighting, right before um, Snape flies away, the way that he deflects the spell work, it hits the Death Eaters behind him. Did you notice the way he whips his wand and they both fall and then he flies away? So he uses McGonagall's spells to take out the guys that he's supposed to be on the same side with. Dumbledore's man until the end. As much as as much as Harry. (laughs) No, I don't think so. We'll get there in a minute. I know. Objectively, Snape <laughs> is only on Dumbledore's side because of Lily, but he's still on Dumbledore's side. Yes, yes, yes. We can both be right. <laughs> 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 um, so 
any comments on the hunt for horcruxes amidst the battle beginning? Um, so anything in that chaos you want to talk about prior to us talking about Snape's memories? My God. These are the parts I just kind of block out because I don't like action in movies. I fall really? asleep. I think it is like the best I, cinematic in no, there. No, it was great. It was great. I'm just saying like it's I can't. Totally thing, there's nothing. I don't have anything to talk about with it is what I'm saying. Like it just, it means less to me. The raising of the defenses was really fun to watch. Like the uh, McGonagall raising the statues and she was like, do your duty. Yeah. And she's been waiting. All the teachers are uh, putting a maxima yeah. into the sky and raising the shields, and it's like yeah. everyone's coming together. Everyone yeah. is rallying. I mean, you felt like it was like a war. It was. It's weird though in the in this like last part because Goyle and Crab are like well, Goyle's there, but Crab's not. So like I think the it whole was yeah, it was it was an actor thing. And so they bring in Blaze Zabini. Yeah, which is so weird to see though, because Blaze. We don't really see him in the movie. He's only there in the sixth book. Yeah. Like, doesn't even, like, there's no mention of him. He gets like one line. Um, and it's weird to <laughs> see him fighting with Draco, like with Draco. I don't know. It was, that's like one little like thing I have with the movie. It's like weird to see. <laughs> yeah. I do like the dialogue with the Grey Lady, the ghost of Ravenclaw yeah. Tower. And they do that scene differently in the book than the movie. And they make it more concise to just get the plot moving forward to the room of requirement again, which is fine. I do like how she says, you know, if you, if you know, oh, oh gosh, it was in my head until I started just trying to say it. <laughs> if you need to ask, then you shall never know. If you, if you know, then you shall. Should you need not ask. Then you need only ask. ask. Then you need only ask because you can ask the room of requirements. Give it to you. Yeah, that was it. Good job. Gold star. Good, good job, team. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think that's a really beautiful part. But Harry comes to that reasoning himself. He realizes, oh, where would where would Harry or where would Voldemort have hidden this? And then he gets the room requirement himself. And then he even remembers that he touched that that diadem before when he was actually hiding his spell book by himself, his potions book, not with Jenny and making out, but um <laughs> With just hiding it himself, he was trying to give himself a remembrance of where he put it. So he saw this tiara, he saw this old, ugly statue, and he put the tiara on the statue as like a marker to be like, okay, this is the spot where near where I hid the book. And so he had already actually touched it. But um, but yeah, anything else um, on the battle? When Ron is able to go into the Chamber of Secrets because he listened to Harry enough oh, times to know how to say open. Yeah, I, th I think it shows like one final moment of Ron's friendship to Harry. Like he paid enough attention to Harry sleep talking to notice how to say open in parcel tongue. I think that's yeah. amazing. Well, in the times that Harry was trying to use parcel tongue to open the locket, to open the um, the snitch, even he was trying to talk to the snitch. But Hermione <laughs> doesn't know how to. Like it, yeah. it shows that Ron really does value Harry. Mm -hmm. And then there's the the other really good. Um, Harry's got people back in a moment where they all come up with the the Patronuses and and fight out the Dementors as he's running out. Um, it's really good. <laughs> There's like a swarm. Yeah, yeah. Storyline. Are you ready? I am yeah. ready. <laughs> so before we move to Snape and Voldemort talking and then Snape's memories, um, Lucius has this final moment of plea. Like, can we just go in? All you want is your son. Like, yeah. But um, yes. Snape's memories. Always. Always. <laughs> oh, yeah. And is that all you get? Mm -hmm. It's all you remember. I when when he said to Dumbledore, you 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 used him. I remember a lamb to the slaughter. To the slaughter. At at that moment. I cried inside for him. I mean, it would. I mean, he's a great actor. Was a great actor, and you saw the Shakespearean, the true. 
that, am I, you know, at that point, I wanted to bring Dumbledore's back. <laughs> I think the movies do, or the books and the movies both do a really good job of redeeming him to the point where a lot of people really think he was this amazing person, but he was not. <laughs> he was, he, all his motives after joining Dumbledore came from his love for another man's wife. He could not let that go. Like, it's obsession. It's not love, it's obsession at this point. Because I'm going to bring in the Patronus comparison here. So Lily's Patronus is a doe. Jane's Patronus is a stag. You know, like, it's cute, it's matching. Snake's Patronus is also a doe. It's not love, it's obsession. And I think that's the clear defining line there. And that's the thing, if he doesn't like Harry, you know, he 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 he, he he really truly does not like Harry. Not that Harry really lives or is a a terrible person. Like Harry's great; he's a good hero. But he does he just because of his just because of James, he it's, does not like Harry. Also, the he's scene, cruel to him. The scene in the bedroom where there's like a crying baby Harry who just like lost his mother in front of him, and Snape runs and like hugs Lily and like cries over her. Like yeah, like. He loves Lily, whatever. But there's a crying baby, and right. like Voldemort, like and he leaves him there. Right. He leaves Harry there for Hagrid to pick up. Shows how much he didn't like, Harry. like it doesn't. He doesn't do anything for Harry. He does it because Harry's Lily's son, yeah. and for Lily. But Lily doesn't even. He joined the Death Eaters, who which are like a cult against the people that Lily are. Like, does he really love Lily that much to? call her a mudblood and then go join a cult that's actively working to exterminate her like he does he does good things eventually but eventually. he they are not out of pure motives I yeah. guess I'd say. also he bullies children and i think that's not, not redeemable so i think that also showed that even someone who we consider the bad guy still has that capacity within them, given the right circumstance or stimulus to have that moment of concern for someone else. Mm-hmm. Like when, he, when he's telling, when he's telling um, Dumbledore, you, you got to protect them. You got, you know, I'll, I'll do whatever I got, hide them. I, I mean, at that point, if Dumbledore had said to him, I'll do it if you slit your throat. He would have slit his throat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Snape has maybe possibly done a few good things in his lifetime. <laughs> a few. Yeah, a few good <laughs> things in his life. And it's, it's a clear thing of, of this world is not black and white. Going back to that, mm-hmm. it is yeah. not black and white. It is very gray. Yeah. And, and also, like with, with Snape's Patronus being a doe, you know, and the obsession thing, like, like I understand where, where that's coming from. And uh, you, I think that that obsession can kind of build it. it like it, it's a very, it's a very colorful line in between all of that. I really don't like the term gray line, all that stuff. Because life is just filled with so much nuance and color. But it's, it's that, it's that, um, I was like his whole being was centered around Lily. Now that's obsession, but that's also other things going Devotion. on too. So much so that like his Patronus forms around the same image, which is which which is odd, which is odd. And that's when Dumbledore is like, oh, <laughs> Lily. Like, like, so we see we yeah, see yeah. some of our things with Tonks and Remus, right? Like, doesn't Tonks is uh, turn into a werewolf or a wolf or something along those lines when she when we after or before we finally figure out that they're becoming a thing, they're getting together. Yeah. So, so like I thought that was I thought that was interesting when when um, or there the other thing I forgot to mention too was uh, this these, this whole series keeps on going back to the humble things, like the Weasleys and all that stuff. And when uh, Harry kind of shows up in the, in the Great Hall, uh, I like, I don't know if the book does this, but the movie sure did. And I was like, ooh, that's intentional. 
it was all the all the ladies and the girls piled around Harry to protect him first. And 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 that's and and I was like, oh, that's very that's, I was like, that's super intentional. That it wasn't all like the big strong guys that immediately ran, you know, but it was it, you know, it was Jenny and all, all, all those other Jenny has reasons, but you know, like that's that but it's all all the other ones did. And I was like, that's 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 interesting. The books keep driving to away from the concept of our normal mode of strength because that's as Voldemort is our normal mode of strength. And so like that that, that was something that stood to me. So I have a paragraph that's better to read than me to summarize about the situation with Snape. The theologian Richard Rohr once wrote, if we do not transform our pain, we will most assuredly transmit it. Snape menaced children for years as he transferred his grief to others. Snape's heart was broken, which was a moment of potential transformation, incarnation, and path for wholeness through brokenness. But instead, he chose to idolize the broken pieces of his love and cling to the past instead of realize the potential to spread his love to others. Snape could have shared his love for Lily with the world after her death. He could have chosen to die to the notion that his love had only one subject. He loved the dead more than the living. Can I go back to the stone? I think there. Mm -hmm. This love for Lily was enough to stir loyalty and even acts of heroic bravery in Snape, but ultimately his unredeemed love for Lily, another man's wife, was not enough to start or stir joy and liberation. The angel at the empty tomb whispers through Snape's tragic life. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Snape chose to stay and to live at the grave. Harry followed the invitation to resurrection found in a Bible verse, and it led him out of Godric's hollow graveyard. We had touched on that last time. But I just, I feel like there's this contrast. And, and when we first started everything, I said that the theme of brokenness versus wholeness comes up so much. And we had the mirror that's broken or whatever. And we have all these horcruxes that have been broken now. And this man, Snape, is just a broken soul who has lived with the grief of his actions causing the death of the only important thing in his life. So I'm not even most important, but the only important thing in his life. He has wrecked and ruined that relationship and that life. And still... He, he makes some heroic decisions, but he doesn't actually transform. And so it's, it's, I think that's the biggest tragedy of the whole thing. And um, I mean, you know, the shirt, whatever, <coughs> but the phrase itself, it just, it haunts, it haunts the whole series because what does it mean? After all this time, he cast the Patronus and always there's no other content to drive that conversation. The book is the same as the movie. That's all there is. But what does that mean? I like what you read there about Snape um, not advancing past where he is right now. Harry goes into the woods. You know, Harry goes like Harry ends up putting aside his parents type of thing, you know, like that, that's, I mean, he's got the resurrection stones also, the, the, but he chooses to drop it. Yeah. He drops it. He's got the resurrection stone there. Okay. And, and also you, you've mentioned to it and we were talking about it last night when we were watching this. Um, I think it's I think it's in there, but it's subtle about who are the three brother brothers now in the story. And I think it is encouraging us to see the three brothers in ourselves. You know, the, the, the ones that are wanting to be ambitions, the ones that are living for the dead, the ones that are that are, you know, that want to just disappear and cheat death type of thing. Like that, that's it, it's, it's subtle in the books. Well, I don't know, in the movies. 
but I, but I kept getting a sense of that being in the story that the three brothers keep lingering. And like what you said about Snape, like being like the brother. Yeah. I think, I think Snape not being able or not ever moving on can also be linked to Dumbledore and his flaws as Dumbledore at times seem to only see Harry as a pawn. Like sure, Dumbledore loved Harry. That is, that is made clear in the books, but he also saw him as a tool, something to be used to take down Voldemort. And that was Dumbledore's, you know, from the beginning of the first, first book, that was Dumbledore's mindset is how are we going to ensure that he is gone for good? That's like where his head is at for all the movies, even though we don't even see it. And I think Snape gets trapped in that as well. Whereas Dumbledore knew about Snape's grief. He knew about what he lost and how he lost the only thing that was important to him. And still, he could have done more to help him, I think. I think he was a very wise person. He could have helped him. And instead, he used him. Yeah. He used him as a tool. He was, he was Snape was just another pawn to Dumbledore, I think, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. It was a chess game. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it's funny how, how Dumbledore keeps his important people close at Hogwarts. He keeps Snape. Who he keeps Snape, who obviously does not have the temperament to be a teacher. He keeps Snape as a potions teacher, and he keeps Trelawney as the divination professor. Yeah. Neither one has for a particular talent for teaching, but they're still kept there because they're important to Dumbledore's future at war. He's not just a headmaster, he's also a war general, and I think the lines between those two are blurred for him. Yeah. It's not a clear cut distinction. Yeah. yeah I mean, he knew, he knows that Triani is a fraud. Like uh, it says for her, for her interview that he was walking away. He was done with it. He knew he was not going to hire her. And then at the very last moment, she started spouting out the prophecy. He, he, the only reason he took her is because this is someone I have to protect. I have to keep her close. She might be useful. But to be fair, I don't think anyone would have met his standard in that position anyway. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't think he would have seen anyone as being legitimate. Um, so Harry comes out of the pensive and he knows that Snape has looked out for him. Snape brought him the sword. Snape um, has, you know, now died, but yet able in this, you know, sheer moment of luck, been able to give him these memories to pass along. I mean, if Harry hadn't had that information, it would have been very challenging for him to finish out as quickly as he did, knowing that the bottom line was he had to die. And so he, he went willingly. He almost failed. Yeah. Because his whole purpose was, or like his main purpose was at the right time. He has to tell Harry all of this. And he almost failed after everything. He almost did not get it to Harry. And it was by sheer dumb luck that Harry was there at the moment he was dying. Well, at the end of the day, they are children's books. So she controlled that plot. Make sure that happens. Yeah. So what what do we feel about Harry's walk into the forest? But I think it's interesting that the, the, the thing that Harry is having to destroy ends up being himself. Mm-hmm. That he's been on this journey to destroy all these things. And he has to destroy himself. Yeah. I'm like we've had one the whole time. Like that's that's a, what did you say, bro? I said, hey, look, we we've, we've had one of the horcruxes the whole time. Yeah. Like yeah. that's that that's that's fascinating. And yeah. we get the moment where, you know, Harry's talking to Ron and Hermione for a moment just because he needs to internally process things that in a novel you can read that it says Harry thought and then have, you know, seven paragraphs, mm-hmm. but Harry doesn't get to do that in a movie. So he does tell it to his friends in that moment, but saying, there's a reason I can hear them. I think I've known for a while and I think you have too, but it's, it's time. That's that's a sweet moment mm-hmm. where where he looks like I think you've known for a while too. Yeah. Like that's a and that's not in the book really. Mm-mm. Yeah. See, that's just no, a, he doesn't even talk to them. It's a tragic moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Or like um, something else not shown in the movie is when he's trying to sneak out and Neville catches him and uh, you know he they're and they're pulling on 
Kong Quigley's body, who he had snuck back to try and fight, and he ended up dying. And Neville was still out there working. Everyone was resting, and he was still the one out there working. And he, he and he said, Neville, you've got to kill the snake. Yeah. So, so Harry's Horcrux dies. And we learn. Okay, so I don't know what you read. But um, <laughs> everything. <laughs> um, so do we ignore the fact that Harry was bit by a basilisk in book two? No, because I've or, seen that. or or do we recognize that in book six? Um no, not in book six, but do we recognize that in the seventh one? It's Harry's willingness to die that destroys the Horcrux because of the prophecy marking him as its equal in the sense that a cup is not alive anyway. So a sword slashing the cup, it is no longer usable. Whereas Harry, as a mortal being, wasn't officially gone at the moment that he got stabbed. So he wasn't actually destroyed yet. So the Horcrux, therefore, didn't get destroyed in that moment. Or is it because... Voldemort had to be the one to do it. Okay. So with the basilisk, I think that because the Phoenix Tears were able to get to him in time, I think that kind of cleared everything out. Um, also, the Horcrux canceled it out. I, 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 two, it's in the star. So I don't think maybe the basilisk venom had time to reach there yet. There's a lot of like little things that could you know help the plot armor. So um, the soul of the Horcrux is bound to the object that it's in. That is why it is so hard to destroy the, the Horcrux. The nothing they did to the locket until the sword came along with the bas basilisk venom blade. If it was just a sword, it would have done nothing. Nothing could destroy the Horcrux. Now, Harry was not destroyed because of the Phoenix Tears. His, the vessel, the, the, the thing holding onto the part of the soul was not destroyed, and so neither was the soul fragment. Also, like with the snake, like the snake got like cut in half. So that like it truly destroyed the snake, therefore the four parts is destroyed. Meanwhile, Harry, he was all right. And then he, in he the forest. He's been alive but... another five years, pretty good. He's <laughs> fine, fine. He's fine. He was nice to have. He was He was not destroyed, you know? Like, right. even in the forest, he literally, he did die. He died. And the, the, the soul took the brunt of the force, of course, and that is why he was able to come back and love magic, and yada, yada, yada. But... He did not, he was not destroyed by the, the venom. He was not destroyed by the, you know, he didn't die from the thing. If, if he had died from it, I'm sure the soul would have died along with him. Well, it was twice. Yeah. <laughs> Multiple times. <laughs> so what do we have to say and think about Dumbledore's conversation with Harry? King's Cross, you say? I haven't watched it in a while. <laughs> it's been a minute since I've seen the conversation between them. Is that when he talked about his backstory, though? Like Dumbledore reveals his backstory? A little bit, yeah. Yeah. And that's where he shares his remorse, yeah. But not in the. Yeah. Well, I watched it this morning. I watched the rest of it this morning. It's, yeah, I mean, it's more detailed in the book, of course. But um, the bottom line is we've got this little piece of Voldemort that's now dead in this little, like, almost looks like a Dobby right. laying there in the fetal position. Right. And then it's kind of like Harry's given a choice. Well, you want to go that. back? Right. King's Cross, you say. This is the train there. Mm -hmm. And then like you can choose either to go back to get on it or not. Right. Mm -hmm. Or to train and go on. I like um, yeah, to on. I like where he says, uh, is this real or is it all in my head? And Dumbledore says, well, of course it's all in your head, but that does not mean it's not real. Yeah. And I think that really signifies that somehow, some way, Dumbledore was, you know, his soul or something was really there talking to him and really able to reach across the veil and be part of it. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't just, you know, Harry talking to, or like in a coma or something like that, talking to this vision of Dumbledore in his head, he gained new information from Dumbledore in that moment. You know, things yeah. that he didn't know already. So yeah, somehow, some way, yeah, Dumbledore was there. 
it was a real thing happening, but it did happen. Yeah. So, so what I do like the Dumbledore says to him, he rephrases the Gryffindor or Hogwarts phrase yeah. that help yes. come to those yeah. who deserve it. Yeah. And I I think that plays out right then because Harry saved Malfoy. Yeah. Harry saved Malfoy in the rule requirement. And Malfoy's mom comes to check on if he's alive or not. And she asks, is Malfoy okay? And he's able to answer yes. Yeah. Because he had saved him. And if he had said no, yeah. like, she would have given him up. Yeah. I think that Harry saving Malfoy is a nice, like, payback to Malfoy saving Harry. Yeah. It's, like, mm-hmm. reciprocating. Yeah, because they could have called Voldemort much faster at Malfoy Manor if Draco had been confident saying, no, that's definitely Potter. I think I think also it goes back to what, you know, we talked about the first movie where Harry is very immediately predisposed to not like Slytherins. And then we see that uh, with the end battle and they, uh, they say all the Slytherins are to be gone. They are to leave. Mm-hmm. And I think it goes and shows Harry's growth at the end of the story where this guy's a Slytherin. Both of these people are a Slytherin, but they're worth saving. Mm-hmm. You know, they are a human life. They are worth yeah. saving. They're worth redeeming. And then we see more payoff. Uh, Snape was a Slytherin. He was not perfect by any means, but he still was, at least to some extent, redeemed. You know, they can be brought back. You know, bad people can be brought back. I mentioned last time that um, some of what Hermione and Um, Harry and Ron were saying was heard by Snape because of a portrait. Harry and Hermione had stolen the portrait off the wall in Sirius Black's house of a former headmaster of Hogwarts, which was Phineas Nigellus Black, who was a Black family member. And so he would sneak information back to Snape to help Snape know what Harry was up to by listening in from Hermione's purse to say, oh, well, they're here and oh, they're doing this. And that's how Snape knew to get him though the sword but Phineas at the very end when Harry goes back to Dumbledore's office which is at this point been Snape's office to um the guy talk to Dumbledore in his portrait for just the last minute of just hey and they're not just standing out in the middle of the woods there or in the on the on the rock ledge there in Dumbledore's office at this point and Phineas Nigelis goes don't let the contributions of the Slytherins go unnoticed. And, and I mean, it's, it's true because Phineas Nigelis was a Slytherin. Snape was a Slytherin. There were, there were Slytherins Black. involved. Yeah, Regulus Black, who got that locket initially. And there were Slytherins involved, who Slughorn, who made sure that things, you know, happened. And, and so that was a redeeming moment for the Slytherin house, I thought. She definitely leans into letting Slytherins be the scapegoat. Yeah, um, yeah definitely. But mm-hmm. she does do a fairly decent job of showing that they are they are still part of it. They they are well, not. And, part and of it. I also think like the Malfoys to go on with this, just they are haggard and just beaten down, like, destroyed. Like there's one scene when it's when going back to like when Griffith got killed in that one scene and like they're all laying out there and they're in Malfoy Man or they're somewhere the Malfoys are there and I think they're at the bank yeah I think the Malfoys are there for some reason though mm-hmm. so it's Lucius and Narcissa look so scared mm-hmm. and I think that the war has really taken toll on them because we we saw that they were like on the, like they weren't expecting what this was. But now they've lived through it, and I think that's like a big thing that's happened. They they look so tired. Well, because the last war, the last one, and the first one, they were they were there for the whole thing. But Voldemort dominated. He there was really you know, the Order of Phoenix was a small resistance, but there was really no one that truly gave them trouble that stood up to them. There was not a real fight to be had. And it all just happened in Godric's Hollow. Through through most of it, Malfoy, they were on the good side. They were on uh, Voldemort's good side. They were, he he was one of the top lieutenants. You know, they were in power. And, but then, you know, one night, one, one decisive battle fight, you know, and and Voldemort is gone. 
Okay. And then he comes back. And so they're like, oh, well, we're good to dominate again. This will be great. You know, good for us. <laughs> and it's not how they think it's going to go at all. Well, and I think all these death eaters that show up with Voldemort, you know, they, they, I think they're kind of embodied by the Malfoys that they are, they, that there's no other, they've made their path and they, they don't like the path that they're on. The Malfoys, it's obvious. Like this is, this this path is shown to be empty, but here we are. We got to ride it out, no matter which way it goes. That's how they look, right? Yeah. yeah. It's, I feel like there's like two strong types of Death Eaters. Obviously, there's like mixes and stuff. But like there's types like the Malfoys are rich and powerful, and they thought that they could just get to the spore and it did be fine. But really, they've been exposed to the fighting now. And then you have the type like Bellatrix yeah. or anyone else that just crazy. Just ready to just, out. they just want their they want like yeah. Greyback maybe yeah. Greyback and Bellatrix those are two shining examples of just like well, crazed death eaters. And I think you see this when at the end here when Harry hops out of out of Hagrid's arms, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, and then all the death not all of them but a lot of the death eaters leave. Like they're just like, yeah, no, to, yeah. no, sir. We gave this guy a chance. It looked like an empty suit. It's completely. Uh, I, I have a thing to bring up with Hagrid carrying Harry back. Yeah. And I think that it's really symbolic there because Hagrid's the one who introduced Harry to the wizarding world. And he held Harry and carried him to his aunt's doorstep. And now he's here carrying Harry when he's dead back to fight the final battle. Mm -hmm. I think it's really like full circle. Yeah, I like I like how it, it connects as well to the seventh book or seventh movie. And the character's like, well, I brought you to this house. I'm going to take you away from it. Mm -hmm. And then didn't know that this 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 next event was coming up where he's bringing, you know, he's carrying Harry's body. He's taking, you know, carrying him out of the world, basically. Well, thanks for participating. Thank you to those of you who've been watching on Zoom and YouTube later. We're so glad that you guys joined us. And thank you for you who've come in person and enjoyed my treats and humored me with the weird decorations. Thank you. But I do, but I do want to uh, take a picture. And some people wore shirts. Um, and and um, please be willing to be in a picture so we can commemorate our fun time. Whenever you are, Pa. <laughs> Good to see you, Cameron. Bye, Mark. This is, all, this is all. Have a good day. Videos. Afternoon, Cameron. He's still got most of his afternoon yeah, he's left. He's in Las Vegas. Yeah. He's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah.